I'm going to give the talk in English. I mean, kind of English. <laughs> okay, so um, about 16 years ago, um, I was in my office in the headquarters of Sony in, uh, in Brussels. And I was handing up a meeting to launch uh, Aibo. Aibo is a robot dog uh, you see here. And we were trying to find out how uh, this dog could mark its territory, which for a robot is an issue, uh, as you might understand. Um, so it was 3 o'clock. I just ended the meeting, and then the phone rings. It's one of my friends, a top executive in a big company in the Brussels area. He calls me, and he, he a little bit, uh, how should I say, pissed off. And he said, you know what? If at 40 years old, you have not created your own startup, your life is a failure. Yeah, you know the story with the Rolex and uh, 50 years old. Huh? So it's, for the French people, it speaks uh, somewhere. Um, so I understand that he's uh, real pissed off being in a corporate and to see all those guys creating startups uh, all over. So he explained to me his project. Uh, asking me uh, what he should do and so on. Because he knew that uh, I have been an entrepreneur, actually, I started my life, uh, my career as uh, an entrepreneur, starting my first startup as I was uh, a student. So we end up the call after one hour of discussion. And, sorry. And um, two weeks later, another friend calls, as well a top executive in a big company, and he tells me the exact same story. If at 40 you have not created your own startup, your life is a failure. So obviously they spoke together, okay? Uh, they are friends, we go for lunch or dinner, we do sports together. One week later, Friday, three o'clock, a third friend, a third close friend, same story. So it seems to be an epidemic, okay? Uh, all those guys, they want to go from the corporate world to the startup world. So, and this is something that, uh, I mean, some of you are in the corporate world, huh? you are in big companies, I know that. Um, of course, you need to pay attention on, on uh, what is going next. The first one is this, he decided to learn, this is a picture, how to cook a hamburger. But then he learned how to manage a kitchen in a fast food. And then he started to manage fast food. After a while, he is now the manager of multiple fast foods. He is an entrepreneur. He, he, he manages multiple teams, and he is happy. So, and he moves, I can tell you, from an industry where there is uh, metal and grease and electronics and so on, to this kind of, uh, of business. However, he is happy, he succeeded. For the two other ones, it's another story. It's another story. Uh, they failed. They have lost all their financial resources, and for one of them, actually, uh, he divorced. So he lost his wife and his kids um, because he could not manage the, uh, the situation. Of course, you can, uh, you can ask, okay, they were uh, executives, maybe they were not fit for, uh, for the startup world. We're going to come to that on the why, the reason for why uh, they, uh, they failed. But it's not the case only of people that want to move to the corporate, corporate world to the startup world that could fail or succeed. Even in big companies, in big brands, we are doing some mistakes. And let me give you a few examples. Is it a success or a mistake? Now this is the last mouse from Apple that you can charge. However, when you charge it, you cannot use it anymore. Okay? It seems crazy for Apple. So even, and it's not only one individual huh, that made this mistake. You, you realize it. It's entire teams that went to the conclusion this was a good product. Okay? So it's a fail. Another one, which is a startup in the Silicon Valley. Maybe you have heard of it. Juicero. Juicero is a startup which has been built around the hypothesis that um, people wanted to, uh, to buy some uh, cold-pressed juice, uh, bio uh, cold-pressed juice, and they did a machine which, which was sold $700 in order to do that. So when they went back to $400, but actually you can press the juice by hand as well. 
which is uh, making the machine unuseful. Um, they have been funded up to 120 million uh, US dollars, which is just crazy for a uh, device that nobody wants. Okay, so it's one of the f recent failures of the of the valley. And now to show that as well in the licensing business, things can go wrong. So this was a fail. Look at this product under Disney license. I don't know about you, but I would not buy it for my kids. Okay? So yes, it qualifies as a fail. But I mean, could you consider what is in the mind of those guys who designed that? Of course, they didn't experiment. Okay, they didn't check with customers. I mean, they would have discovered that something is wrong. Well, it depends on the, okay, it depends on the distribution network. Okay, so in fact, at, at uh, we, we see that this kind of failure can happen at uh, a different uh, different level, but any individual in a company can provide an added value. Um, I have a, a good friend who is actually maybe one of the top most um, speaker in customer service, I have asked him, do you have an example of a little guy in a, in a company uh, that would uh, have an impact on his business just because he's experimenting in the right way? And this is what he told me. Yes, my dear Philip. Sometimes it's very simple to multiply your revenue per customer. If you have a good idea, like this guy in New York, he is a bathroom attendant, and he is sick and tired to get only a few cents as a tip. So one day, he put two plates. On one plate, he has written small penis 20 cents. And on the other plate, he has written big penis one dollar. And of course, all the guys who came to the bathroom, they all gave one dollar. It's very simple. And of course, I have plenty of good ideas to increase the performance of your company. See you. Okay, so this is a kind of small example. An individual, whether uh, he's at the, uh, in, in the ladder of the uh, corporate, or if he's an individual somewhere at the bottom of the enterprise, anyone can contribute with ideas. Okay, so now we are going to start to discuss why it did happen, why those people failed. First, we have to understand that we are formatted. We are formatted, and this format, in this case, will bring us straight into the into the wall. Okay, this is a wall. No, this is not the wall. This is an hippopotamus. <laughs> <laughs> we come back to the wall afterwards. So the formatting actually uh, allows us to um, to think in a in a very specific way. And this is an hippopotamus. Now it's uh, it's to symbolize the uh, the hippo. Uh, the hippo. Uh, Ash uh, spoke a little bit about it. Hippo means highest pet person opinion. It's an acronym. Okay. And this is something that we have to fight, whether we are the founder of a startup or whether we are in the corporate world. We have opinions. Everyone has an opinion, but usually the one who has the strongest opinion is the boss. And this is why we call that an hippo. And we have to fight the hippo, the, uh, hippo syndrome. And the difficulty. Uh, is that when you make a decision, 90% of the decision is made on an emotional basis and only 10% on a rational basis, based on logic. So when you have to deal with uh, EPOS or with uh, people who have this kind of opinion, you need to deal at the, uh, the uh, emotional level. And this is something that I've cracked, actually, and this is uh, why I'm doing some conferences now in corporates, it's because I found a way to go through the hippo issue doing some um, emotional learning journeys. And we'll come to that uh, in uh, using a few experiments. So my first friend actually failed because of an opinion. He was absolutely sure that his ID was good. He loved, uh, he, uh, he fell in love with his solution. He developed for two years this ID, spent all his resources, and discovered that uh, nobody wanted it. Very classical. Okay? But he was sure that he was right because of his past success. His brain is wired on the fact that he had success on a regular basis. My second friend had a different issue. 
So this is uh, the syndrome that I call the chicken who has found a knife. Doesn't know what it is. Doesn't know how he could use it. And he doesn't know what it is for. So, and in this case, it's even a high knife, which is the next step. Huh? But, uh, um, so you will find that when you have, let's say, old school people, top executives, let's say in the 60s, and you start to speak to them about big data, deep learning, this kind of stuff, you know? And they say, what's the point? Okay, it's technology, uh, I don't see what is interest. And my second friend, actually, uh, the, I mean, the, the one that failed as well, he started to develop a PC software when the web applications were starting to happen. And he didn't see the web as a threat to PC applications. Again, he developed for two years and a half, almost three years, his PC application. And when he went on the market, there was a web application that was equivalent to, the, to his PC application that was better and cost it 10 times less than his PC application with no deployment issue because it was uh, web-based. So he failed because of that. So the chicken was found a knife is a syndrome that uh, needs to be uh, taken care of. Every time something new happens, you have to ask yourself, what does it mean for me? Okay. So we, I was saying they were going straight into the wall. Okay, here is a wall. And actually, this is a very good example of what happens when, uh, when you are wired by your brain. Uh, the, your brain is the sum of your past experience. The entire sum of your past experience. So you're going to have a logic which is based on your, on your past experience. No, I need to have um, I need to have uh, a guinea pig. It will be you speak English, right? No, you speak English. No, you speak English. Come on, they understand me as well, huh? Okay, so I will make you a favor. You will you will answer in French, okay? Oh no. No. You? No. Come on. You're a good public, a great assembly, I told my wife, okay? You want to do it in French or English? Just in a, in a couple of seconds, I want you to describe the world that you see. Couple of seconds. Des briques, des cailloux, des trous, pas de ciment. Okay, bricks, stones, holes, no cement. Okay? Okay, clear for everyone? And this is fun because we all know what is a brick. And uh, we all recognize when you have some bricks which are all together, uh, left and right, bottom to top, it's a wall. What is amazing is you could have seen that. Okay, a cigar in the middle of the wall. So what's in the cigar? One, two, three. Ah, okay. Sorry, something else, but not a cigar. Okay. So, of course, you are not expecting a cigar in the middle of this wall. Okay? Your brain has come to the conclusion that it was just a, a wall and is trying to make things fit into what you've learned in the past. So, anything new, your brain is going to make it fit with the way you have learned in the past. This is the way it works. However, the brain learns very fast. Now, if I bring back the image, you see very clearly the cigar in, uh, in the middle of the wall, right? You see at what speed the brain is learning. So, in fact, your brain is being modified, is being changed uh, as I speak. Right? You're learning as I speak. So now that I've done this small experiment with you, uh, I will show you another experiment I'm, I'm doing on a regular basis, uh, which is a funny one. It's a, I call it the bike experiment. I'm using a bicycle, which has been, it's a prototype, uh, which has an inverted handlebar. So when you turn to the left, the front wheel goes to the right and vice versa. 
it's a real simple change, okay? So, and this is me uh, in, in October, November. Actually, I brought this bike to San Francisco at the Lean Startup Week uh, in November. So, I, I would not go through the Tour de France with it. Huh? Obviously, it's not very comfortable. Uh, and it requires a certain level of focus in order to, uh, to make it happen. But you know what? Everyone can focus to, to this point. So the question, um, to your point of view, how fast does it take to adapt to, sell, uh, to such a small change? So you, you know it now. You know what to do. You just need to invert. Sorry? So let's say, I, I, will, I will be more precise. Let's say that I'm asking you to do three meters three meters, uh, not even turning, just in straight line. How many trials do you want to do in order to make it happen? One? Five? Okay. Three? Three hours. You said five tries? Five tries. Okay. Five tries, three hours? Ten, ten tries? Okay. Who says less than uh, five tries? I mean, somebody who is able to focus. How many tries? One. One. Three. Three. Okay. Usually, I have some, many people saying uh, one or two, but three, I accept. So um, you're, you're the lucky guy because you answered to the uh, break of war. But you're the lucky guy because I brought my bicycle with me. <laughs> and we're going to make an experiment. Okay, please come on. I don't want any issues. Okay, so I just, I'm just asking you, but wait, uh, before starting, I need to give you some few instructions, okay? F first, don't try to go fast. Don't try to go fast, okay? Um, second, you said three tries? Okay, if you do it in one try, three meters, and I will, I will, uh, I will count it. Okay, if you come here, in one try, I give you 200 euros. You do what? 200 euros. Okay? <laughs> it's not over. It's not over. Um, if you fail and you, you do it at the second try, I give you 100 euro. And if you fail at the second try and you do it at the third try, I give you 50 euro. Okay? Then, if you fail at the third try and you would like to go for a first one and you fail on the first one, you give me 50 euro. <laughs> and then we double every time. Okay, so it's a compromise between your ego and uh, your wallet. <laughs> okay? So you know how to ride a bike, I of course. I don't answer to your last question. <laughs> okay. No, no, you, you stop whenever you want. Okay? Okay. <laughs> so let's go, let's go for the first try. Light, okay? Where is the target? <laughs> One, two, three. I can tell you, you, you don't need the brakes. Okay? You go easy, easy. <laughs> okay, this was the first try. Okay? So let's go for 100 euro now. <laughs> it's a reflex of balance. Donc là, il faut que j'aille à gauche. <laughs> okay, thank you. So now I'm going to explain what is behind this uh, this uh, exercise. But first, I'm going to show you what happens after one hour of training.
Okay, so now why is it happening this way? First, you learn by doing. So this is something that, uh, that uh, you know. But what is interesting is that the brain is working in such a way that you need to integrate the learning. And in this specific case about uh, learning a new move or a new software for riding a bike, and maybe you remember how long it, take, it took you to ride a bike uh, in a normal way when you were young. Okay? It, it took some time. But the key point is you, you could train for two hours, it won't work because you need to integrate that learning at night when you're sleeping. This is at that point that your brain is going to create new uh, networks of neurons that will allow you to add a new software to your brain. So you need to have repeat training, but not repeat training only on one day. You have to repeat uh, over days. And then you discover that understanding is different than the O. Okay? You have all understood what you need to do, which is to invert the, uh, the underbar. However, making it happen is something which is absolutely different. So this is why if you read an excellent book like uh, Running Lean uh, from, from Ash, you need to practice again and again and again in order to capture the essence of, um, of, the, uh, of the book. So what we have seen here is called a cognitive bias, which is called overconfidence. Okay? Uh, because of your past success riding a bike, you, you think that you can ride this bike in the same way very fast. And then you develop this overconfidence bias, which comes to another one, which is called planning fallacy. Typically, when you say three tries and uh, it takes three days, actually it took me three days to do uh, what, you've, you, what we have seen, three days with uh, three sessions of 30 minutes, okay? To, uh, to, uh, to have the, uh, the feeling and to be able to ride it. So overconfidence, planning fallacy. This is why we can fail uh, considerably uh, uh, with uh, this kind of uh, experiment. And when I do that with um, CEOs or top executives, then they understand what means this overconfidence bias and the past success in their operations. That something new is different and need to be addressed in a different way. One of the conclusions of the experiment is uh, there is a way to, to cure overconfidence, of course, which is to define what are the risky hypotheses and to experiment and, and to validate them. Okay? This is why it is so important to define your most risky hypotheses and to, uh, to validate them or invalidate. So another question is, the friends that I had that failed, and along with all the people I have seen in the corporate world or in the startup world that failed, where they fit for this kind of career change? And I came to a conclusion as well that you don't have the same kind of mindset and, but I mean deep mindset, the, the kind of mindset uh, like you are right-handed or left-handed, you see? Uh, when, uh, when you are right-handed, if you, you break your arm, you will start to write with your, with your left hand after a while and you will succeed. But as soon as your right arm is uh, back, then you will start to write again with your right arm. Okay, so this kind of mindset, this kind of uh, wire of the brain is something that we find as well in the activities of a company. So looking at the activities of a business, we, get, we can see uh, three big phases. The first one is the innovation and discovery part. Uh, this is where you are going to use the design thinking and lean startup activities. This is wh where you are going to test uh, your, uh, your hypothesis. Uh, this is where you are going to iterate and, and to redefine your plan A as uh, we discussed it before. And once you've got evidence that you've got something, you will move to the next step, which is scaling up uh, your uh, product or your service. Up to the point, you reach profitability. And once you have reached profitability, you are in the third phase, which is a production or exploitation phase. For those three phases, you need very different kind of people. You need people who have some uh, exploration skills in the early phases, and you need people who have 
exploitation skills for the last one. And this last one is very important because this is the one where you are going to bring money back to the company, you are going to bring money back to the shareholders, and you are going to fund the next generation of products which are in the early stage. Okay? When you are a startup, you don't have money, so you need to, uh, you, you don't have this, uh, this part which is bringing money, you are obliged to call for funds from VCs in order to make it happen. So on the left hand side, exploration, you're going to use design thinking, lean startup, and so on. On the right hand side, you look for optimization. So you're going to start to use Lean, lean Sigma or Six Sigma uh, kind of uh, processes in order to get the maximum profit out of your operations. And we know today that uh, Lean Sigma or Six Sigma is to improve your quality by reducing the variance on your processes. And what is innovation? It's a huge variance. So the best managers of the optimization phase are the best killers of innovation, unfortunately. When you look at the corporate world, all the top execs in the corporate world are the guys who are on the optimization phase. And this is one of the reasons for which innovation is stalled in big companies. It's because the top management they want to extract the maximum money out of optimization and exploitation. And they don't understand the mindset we need to have in order to, uh, to uh, innovate or to get new products on board. Furthermore, furthermore, the guys um, uh, are not building the teams in the same way. So the uh, left hand side, is the um, kingdom of serial entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. And basically, you find something new, you scale it up, you give it to people that exploit, and you come back to defining a new business. I represent that under the, um, the scheme of three kinds of activities with water. The first one, exploration, is about divers, uh, finding a, a, a treasure which is uh, somewhere in the sea. You need to find out where are the best places. So you are going to use tools and processes in order to find that. And if uh, you don't find the right spot quickly enough, you move to an uh, next spot and so on. So you need to have very specific people that are going to seek based on, uh, on uh, uh, maps, uh, on uh, legends and so on, where they will find uh, things. The scaling team uh, is like a white water rafting team. They are all together, they are trying not to lose uh, some people uh, inside the, the, the rapids, and they want to go as fast as possible in order to, uh, to scale up. And once you are in exploitation, you have a rowing crew. And the team is, has a very different behavior. They don't even look at the objective because they know it. Okay? You have only one guy uh, looking at the objective. And in order to speed up, they need to be synchronized as much as possible. So it's the supply chain stuff and so on, you know? It's uh, something which is completely streamlined. In companies which are pretty well organized, like uh, Google, like Intuit, uh, you see that they are allocating 70% of their budget on uh, production, 20% on scaling up, or businesses which have proven to be right and they want to, uh, to go to profitability, and 10% on exploration, innovation, to find out what will be the next relays of growth, which is a pretty nice uh, challenge. So, okay. um, so what happens when one of the guy here has an ID? What do you think will happen? He will be asked to go back to his job, right? Uh, this is the power of, of formatting. Do you know how fast we can format people? When your job is at stake and you are distracted and you want to do something else, you're back uh, to your initial job very quickly, I can tell you. So it's a matter of culture. It's a matter of culture, and uh, the best example I can see in this respect of somebody who has uh, established the right culture is Elon Musk. When he, uh, he, he, he has this culture of observing and questioning, okay, why? Why people are doing things like that? And this is uh, 
when you discovered that the rockets launched by NASA were using software that were 20 to 30 years old and very old technologies, just to keep in mind that the power you have in your smartphone today is higher, and the CPU power is higher than the entire set of computers that the NASA had for the launch of the Apollo program. Okay? One smartphone, all the computers of NASA, just to compare. So he said, OK, with the technologies we have today, we can do much better. And this is why he started to do uh, his uh, SpaceX program. Of course, he had to experiment. Nothing worked from the start uh, very quickly. And he learned a lot from the first experimentation up to the point that now he's landing back a rocket in a small spot in the middle of the ocean with waves. It is just crazy. OK? and at a cost which is a fraction of the cost uh, which was used by, uh, by NASA, just because of the latest technologies. So if you look around you, if you have a culture of observing and questioning all over in your company, then you can start to have some big breakthrough. If you uh, experiment as well, this will de-risk as much as you can, even within corporate. If you don't experiment, you could have big issues. Okay, it could be one shot. So um, I have one conclusion, conclusion slide uh, now. Takeaways for success, to my point of view. First, you need to be aware of your brain formatting and the culture of your company. And you need to deal with that in order to find your way uh, to make things happen. Second point, you need to have the courage of defying the status quo. And last, you need to set up experiments to learn, validate, and mitigate risks inside, uh, inside your, your company. And I will say one final sentence that I want you to remember. If there is one thing to remember, this is this one. To move to the success, the what you know already is not that important. What is really important is what you do when you don't know. Thank you. Hey, hello everyone. Can you all hear me well? So maybe with a show of hands, I'd like to get a, a sense of who's in the room. So how many of you are here uh, with a startup? Show of hands. Uh, maybe corporates. Okay, some. Uh, students? Faculty? No students, no faculty. Okay. All right. I, I think that's most of you in here. Uh, maybe next question. How many of you here are familiar with... Um, Okay, sounds good. How many of you here are familiar with uh, Lean Startup? Would you call yourself a beginner? Yeah. Beginners? Advanced? Okay. So about 25% more advanced. So what I wanted to do here, because the organizers asked me to share some of the thinking that has evolved over time. So there'll be stuff here for beginners to get you started, to think about how to lay the foundation for practicing Lean, Lean Startup. And then there'll be some stuff here also for more advanced people. Um, so I've been practicing Lean Startup for many years now. And a lot of these ideas seem simple, but simple doesn't mean they're easy. So you will see a mix of kind of different things over here. So we'll kind of kick this off. I have 10 things that I'm going to share with you. Uh, number one, you can only learn by doing. So a lot of entrepreneurship in general is like practicing a martial art. You cannot watch martial arts movies or read books. And, uh, and become Bruce Lee. You actually have to go into the dojo and do the work. So it requires discipline. And again, it all looks easy, but it does not necessarily translate into uh, something that you can do just as easily. Um, if you don't like the martial art analogy, it's like playing golf if you play golf. You can, again, just watch a bunch of uh, golf channel or, or read a bunch of books and go and hit the ball. You actually have to go there, look a little bit of silly in the, uh, in the beginning, get outside your comfort zone, and that's how you get better, that's how you get stronger. Number two, separate principles from tactics. So in, in the lean startup world, there are lots of tactics out there. And unfortunately, I see a lot of people cherry picking. So they might pick something like split testing or A-B testing or running an experiment or 
if you bring in growth hacking and those tactics, a lot of people will pick those as well and start doing them to grow their business. Don't internalize the principles first. The tactics are not going to help you. So what worked for Dropbox or Airbnb or whatever startup that you are trying to mirror against, you can't just copy what they're doing. You have to understand why they're doing it. So start with principles. Principles are what guide what you do, and then tactics follow. So if you are applying this in a B2B context versus a B2C context, um, in a hardware versus a software, the principles tend to be the same. You know, Everyone has customers. You all have to understand what customers want. Uh, so those are universal principles. But how you uncover that, what you do, are going to be different from one to the other. So throughout the day, I think with some of the, 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 the talks and the, and the coaching, you will see a combination of both principles and tactics. But just be careful to separate one and don't just blindly copy a tactic and hope it will work. Uh, the next thing I want to highlight is standardizing on vocabulary. So the Lean Startup has spread, which is a very powerful thing, and that's great. I feel for the first time there is a universal language of entrepreneurship. Just like we struggle to communicate with other people around the world till we have some kind of uh, a common, common vocabulary, the same thing used to happen. Um, so going back 15, 20 years, I would not be here uh, doing any of this because I would be, I, I come from a software background. I was only talking to start, uh, software and, and technical entrepreneurs um, because we could speak our language, but we couldn't talk about entrepreneurship on a general scale. I think Lean Startup gave us a common vocabulary, a common language. At the same time, I think it spread too quickly where there are a lot of terms that get mixed up sometimes. Uh, my favorite one to talk about is the minimum viable product. Um, lots of people use it to mean many different things. So I'm going to suggest my definition, and I don't necessarily think you should ad adopt this definition, but it's more important to standardize on one. So I've worked in many environments, big companies sometimes, where in the same company you have 10 different people using 10 different definitions. And some people describe MVP as one thing and others describe it as something else. So it's important to standardize and pick the definitions you like of a lot of these terms. What is MVP? What is a business model? Um, and then just in your own team, agree on what it is so you have that common vocabulary. So Eric Ries was particularly very open with the Lean Startup, which is, I believe, the power of why it spread. Uh, but at the same time, because he didn't set his foot down, some of these these uh, different definitions kind of leaked out as well. So when he blogged about MVP the first time, he was talking about the build, measure, learn loop and talking about the fastest way to learn. So you, you put something out there um, and learn from customers, and the fastest way around this build, measure, learn loop would be what we call an MVP. The problem with that is that we can use a lot of things to learn. So you can use everything from customer interviews to demos to teaser pages. I think most of you will know what these are, uh, down to some actual MVP tactics, uh, concierge, Wizard of Oz, uh, release 1.0. So when I've gone in places, people have put landing pages and called them MVPs. And I found other people in the company building actual working prototypes and actual code, and they call that MVP. So there's a big disconnect on what the MVP is to where it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Um, so I have a more stricter definition. So I really subscribe to all the three letters in the acronym. So the minimum means the smallest thing you can do, so the smallest solution you can build. The viable and the product aspect of it um, are what the other two parts try to get across, is that it's the smallest solution you can build that delivers some customer value. If you don't deliver value to customers, then you don't have anything that's viable yet. It's really a demo or a page, but it's not yet a minimum viable product. So a landing page is not a product, and that's why I don't consider those things to be products. Um, I'm also a big fan of trying to de-risk the business model as quickly as possible. So you have to be able to test pricing. You have to be able to test the ability to make money. So I'm a big fan of trying to capture value with your minimum viable product as quickly as possible as well. So I don't subscribe to the notion of putting your MVP out for just for learning. So don't give it away for free. Call it an alpha or a beta because you're asking for forgiveness before you even engage the customer. What you want to do instead is make sure you are building a minimum product, but make sure it's a good enough product where it does the job. And you put that out there and don't ask for forgiveness. Ask for the customer to use it, get value, and then pay you. And if they don't do that, that's where you iterate and make sure you get to that as quickly as possible. 
So if you use this more stricter definition, those other things kind of get wiped away. So a customer interview or a demo or a teaser page is not a minimum viable product. Um, so I'll share with you kind of my three, uh, three, three parts of, uh, of, of how I would break, break these into, into different sections. So the first thing that I call, uh, call out here is the cycle around the build, measure, learn loop. I don't call it a minimum viable product. I just call it an experiment because you're building something, putting it in front of customers. You have got some assumptions or, or, or hypotheses going into it. Um, you measure, collect some data, and then you learn. So that's very much like running an experiment. So to me, that's an experiment. All those other things I call an offer. They're all ways for you to test interest in your product. They're all techniques for you to understand what needs to go in your minimum viable product. So a demo is a great way uh, to test what customers want before you actually have to build it. So when we teach this process to, to uh, entrepreneurs and in innovators, we don't let them build an MVP first. We have them build demos and assemble an offer. Go and sell that first. So the process is build a demo, try to sell that, and until you can sell that, don't even build the product. So that's kind of how you want to think of that. So an offer is, is uh, what those things would be. And then your minimum viable product would be true products that you put out there. So your release 1.0, which is the smallest or minimum features with which you can learn. Uh, the concierge MVP, which might be using a consulting or service approach for you automate or replace with the product. And then finally, the wizard of us, which is like a Zach or which is a like a Tesla where you might not build everything. Tesla's first product was a very expensive minimum viable product. It was a Tesla Roadster, which they didn't even build themselves. They licensed from, they, they licensed the car from Lotus uh, and put their battery, which was the thing they wanted to really test. That was their, their innovation, that product. Um, so that's an example of a Wizard of Oz. It looks like a car Tesla built, but unless you know it's not, you think that it is. Okay, so these are the three kind of categories. So an experiment, an offer, the minimum viable product. So that's how I like to distinguish them so we have clarity in what these things are um, instead of mixing them all and calling them all MVP. Now we get a bit more to kind of my lessons learned just practicing Lean Startup for the last few years. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on running experiments and I tried to get very good at running experiments after I wrote my first book, Running Lean, and I found that Running experiments was hard. There's a scientific method. You can go, you can go what seems like overboard for entrepreneurs. You can do double blind tests. You can try to get statistically significant data. All that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of rigor. It takes a lot of discipline. And so I decided to study scientists and I went back. I come from a, a engineering background. So I had some exposure to the scientific method, but I wanted to get even deeper. And I started to look into science and I found out, found out that even the scientists don't consider running experiments to be the most important thing they do. And to give you a clue of what that might be, here's a well-known celebrated uh, scientist of our time, and he didn't run a traditional empirical experiment his whole life. Well, early on, he, when he was in school at the Zurich Polytechnic Institute, and his professors told him to stop being a scientist because he was really bad at lab work. Um, he was a good theoret uh, uh, theoretical person, but really bad at actually running experiments. So he was advised to get out of the science profession. And so Albert Einstein did do that. He went and worked in the patent office for some time. But he still came up with the theories of relativity, which were validated not by him, but by other empirical scientists in his lifetime and gave him lots of, uh, lots of, lots of uh, credibility and, and fame and, and success, which was, which was great for him to, to be able to experience. Um, but the point to make over here is that the most important thing scientists do is not start with experiments. There needs to be something that comes before that. When Albert Einstein was asked, how did you come up with these amazing, you know, uh, these theories of, of space, which are things we can't even, you know, fathom. They're just unmeasurable at, at, at kind of at that time. Um, he said he attributed that to the models that he actually built. So if you remember your high school physics class, these are the models of trains and clocks and running at the speed of light with a flashlight. All of those things were his thought experiments. And so he used models to approximate the problems he was trying to fathom, the problems he was trying to solve, and then use math and science to come up with a theory which was then validated by other people. And I've asked more and more scientists, and they also agree that they have a problem that they first start with. They then build a model to try to explain away a phenomenon, and then they will use experiments to validate that. 
So they don't start with experiments. It would be kind of silly for a scientist just to go into the lab with no hypothesis, with no model aligned, and just start mixing a bunch of compounds to see what happens. Uh, they, don't, they don't typically do that. So if you look at the scientific method more closely, this is a, uh, a scientific method kind of description in a nutshell by Richard Feynman, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Some of you uh, might recognize his name. Um, and this is how he describes it. The scientists go out, and he doesn't even call them uh, hypotheses. He calls them guesses. They go out there and make a guess. They take a problem. They guess at a solution. They then use that to build a model where they compute some consequence, validate your assumptions, and based on that, you will update your understanding of your business model, your understanding of your risks. So this, in many ways, is what I would call the entrepreneurial method, which would be the parallel to how scientists work. So don't just run blind experiments. Start with a goal, start with a model, and then use that uh, to test. Another thing which might seem like a deviation from a lot of the early lean startup kind of advice is we, we, we pay a lot of um, weight on learning. We say learning is the measure of progress, validated learning is the measure of progress. And that also comes from the scientific method influence on the lean startup. So in the early days, we would talk a lot about how you can just measure what you build. You have to measure really what you're learning. And I'm not saying that learning is bad, so I don't want, to, I don't want that to be taken out of context. But I do want to, to highlight that sometimes people go overboard with learning. When you turn your, your startup into a science project, you can go overboard with the learning where all you're doing is learning and you forget about actually making money or actually, actually making the business model work. And so I, I share this as, I describe this as the goals of scientists and startups and, and entrepreneurs are different. So scientists are really in the, in the business of learning. For them, learning is, true, is, is the true currency because they are trying to uncover some unnatural phenomenon. They're trying to understand the world better. And so the pursuit of knowledge is their reward. So they will go through great lengths to do double blind tests and to take as long as it takes to actually prove that something is definitively true. Um, knowing and the whole idea of falsifiability is a whole other thing is they know that whatever they think through today could be wrong tomorrow, which is why if you ask any scientist, do you believe in, in global climate change? They will always say yes, but maybe not because they have to have two conflicting ideas in their mind at the same time because you don't really know for certain, uh, which you know, gets, gets them in trouble. That's a separate, separate thing. Um, but on the entrepreneur side, we are not in this for perpetual truths. We are in here to do just enough learning to where we build a repeatable and scalable business model before we run out of resources. And so you can take some shortcuts. So sometimes you can use qualitative learning. I can go and talk to 10 customers and if they all say no to me, I don't have to go and prove that out with thousands of people in a double blind test. If 10 people say no to me, that is statistically significant as far as I'm concerned. I need to try to turn those no's to yeses. And so that's kind of the mindset you need to have is that the, 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 the approaches are different. So while learning is key, learning helps you understand what it is you need to do with your business model. Don't go overboard with it. You need to use some instincts, some judgments to try to make predictions without getting all the data in and then see if the business model works. And if it works, you kind of move on to the next riskiest thing. So that's just the, the, the cautionary tale there. So I've, maybe the way this manifests itself, after the writing of my first book, I've talked to lots of entrepreneurs who, who have come up to me and said, you should be proud. I have used all your techniques. I've followed every page. I've done hundreds of interviews. I can show you all the interview notes. And I'm like, that's great. It's commendable because it takes a lot of this. And how many customers do you have? And when the answer is a disappointing zero, that to me doesn't make me happy, right? Because that's you learning for the sake of learning, following a process uh, with the hopes that someone is going to reward you with a gold star or give you an A grade. But in entrepreneurship, you don't get an A grade just for following process. You get it for getting results. So that's kind of a, something just to keep in mind. Learning is a means to get results, but you have to focus on the results. Um, another thing that I've kind of learned by working with bigger and bigger teams is that we have, the nature of work has changed. We have actually become a very specialized workforce and with that comes biases. So if I give you a problem um, and if I talk to a developer for, and I ask them what are possible solutions to that, I'm going to get build solutions. I'm going to have them tell me I need to build more features, I need to make my product faster, I need to make it better, um, all in terms of what they know best. 
if I talk to a designer, usually it's a UX type of a solution, or it's usually so something having to do with design. If I talk to a marketer, they're going to talk about marketing things. Um, and I've learned that just by going off with problems and not solutions and talking to people and realizing that. Now, that by itself isn't bad, but the thing that the build, measure, learn loop doesn't tell you how to do is how to source good ideas. Is that your experiments are only going to be as good as the input ideas, because remember, the build, measure, learn loop only uh, allows you to test what you think you want to test. If you start with bad ideas, you're not going to get good results. And so you have to be open to sourcing ideas from anywhere. The answer to this question, where do good ideas come from, is that good ideas can come from anywhere. And so it's very, very critical that you build a cross-functional team. It's very critical that you don't just have a bunch of developers or a bunch of designers or hustlers on your team. You need to have everyone involved, and you need to share your problems with everyone and use that to source a bunch of ideas and then use the Lean Startup experiments to actually test them. Uh, this technique is nicely codified in design thinking. So this is a converge-diverge technique that IDEO invented many years ago that they still use to this day. And what they are trying to show over here is that if you, if you couple problem and solution together, you actually limit the choices of solutions. So if I'm the CEO of the company and I'm addressing you guys and I come and present a bunch of business problems at you, and I also start talking about ways we could potentially fix it, none of you are gonna come up with independent ideas because you don't wanna go against me and we're all going to just implement my set of ideas. This happens all the time, not just in startups, but also, of course, in, in big companies, where the hippos, the highest paid officials in the room, sometimes will come with a problem solution, and then nobody else will dare go up against them. So what the ideal guys try to do to avoid this type of groupthink or hippo phenomenon is to really encourage the leaders or, or the, the facilitators of the meeting to come together and only present problems and then empower everyone to go away and independently think up of solutions. Because that allows a collective intelligence, collective knowledge. It allows you to avoid that curse of specialization. I have biases about what I think solutions are, but many of you will have your own ideas, which might be better than mine, and I never hear them unless I do something like this. So let everyone go away, come up with independent solutions, and when they come back together, you then converge again, and you ideally have maybe a board where you put, put up all the ideas. You can make them anonymous if you'd like, and people vote based on the merit of the idea. And if one idea is more promising than the other, that's the one you should try to test. Instead of testing the one that comes from who you think is the most vocal person or the most senior person. So that's kind of a technique that lots of companies have started to use, and it works quite well to be able to avoid that uh, curse of specialization. Another thing to kind of internalize is this notion of failure. I know failure is a taboo, and we all try to say, you know, failure is a precondition for learning, and we, will, we, will, we like to fail. But I find that no one really enjoys failing. Even if you go into Silicon Valley, as much as they say they celebrate failure, if you talk to the companies, that is their biggest fear. They don't want failure, and they pretend they're not failing until they fail, and then they say, okay, I failed. And, but they, they pretend they aren't for the longest time. But if you look at innovation, if you look at scientific discoveries, any kind of a discovery, all the ones I show over here, you see a common theme, and that is that all these were accidental discoveries. All these technically were failure. They were all breakthrough discoveries, some life-changing, some life-taking in this case. Uh, but the point to make here is that failure is a precondition for breakthrough. If you think about breakthrough by definition, it requires you to have some unexpected outcome. If you always knew what was going to happen, there is no breakthrough thinking because you always knew what was going to happen. So for you to actually make that hockey stick curve that we talk about in, in the startup world to actually start going up, you have to have lots of unexpected things happen before you can turn that around. Um, so the most important thing that these scientists di did when they, when they encountered these failures is that rather than throwing away their experiments, they explored further. So they stopped what they were doing and said, this is very interesting. Why did this just happen? I didn't expect it to happen. And they asked why. Um, this is something we don't do enough in the Lean Startup. We have this magic word called the pivot, and people pivot too quickly. So people will have a failure and say, oh, that didn't work. Let's try idea number two. No, let's try idea number three. Let's shut up entirely. And that is just a disguise, see what sticks strategy. So unless your learning, unless your pivoting is grounded in learning, you're just throwing stuff up on the wall and hope that maybe you'll get a better result. And what en eventually ends up happening is you just keep hitting some ceiling of achievement and you never break through. 
So the only way to break through is to really chase those failures. So I actually celebrate failures. When I see startups in the early stage that are struggling, that is a great opportunity to learn. But instead of calling it failure, I channel this other scientist, Buckminster Fuller, who kind of removes the word failure from the vocabulary of science. And so don't think of it as failure, think of it as an unexpected outcome. So you have a business model, you have a lean canvas or a business model canvas. You think these are your customers, you went out and you tried to talk to them and they said no to you. Rather than just randomly changing to something else, ask them why they said no to you. you know, so go and study that, that reason, that was an unexpected outcome. And that's where you might learn the reason you failed or the reason you got this unexpected outcome. And the pivot that you do after that is going to be a lot more meaningful, a lot more impactful. Okay, number eight. Um, all of these ideas we, we have kind of codified into something we call a lean sprint. So you can run these in a, in a cadence fashion, which is again a very important thing to do. So I talked about discipline in the beginning. Um, when I was practicing this in the beginning, I was doing it mostly by myself and then a small team. And we didn't have as much process, as much discipline. But as your team begins to grow, as you become serious with this, you have to have some repeatable cadence. Um, those of you that come from a Scrum or Agile background or Design Sprint background, this is very much inspired by that type of thinking, is we need to iterate uh, and have a repeatable rhythm or cadence. I'm a big fan of time boxing because time is the scarcest resource we have. In, with any idea, you can get more people, you can get more money, um, add it to your project, but you can never get more time. If you miss your timing for your idea, the market is lost. So you have to prioritize timing uh, or, or, the, or time boxing above everything else. So the Lean Sprint is nothing more than a time box iteration, whether it's two weeks or three weeks. I recommend most teams start out with two or three weeks um, for running build, measure, learn loops, but not just running build, measure, learn loops, but doing everything I talked about. So this is a visual of what a, a sprint might look like. So we start on the far left with tools like your business model or your metrics. Um, those help you identify where you might be failing today. So you first get together, if you are, again, follow an agile process, you do a sprint kickoff where you talk about your business model, you talk about your metrics, you identify the problems. All the team then goes away and comes up with some ideas. And those are the light bulbs or the validation plans you then come together and put a bunch of them on the wall or share them in any way you like. You then prioritize which ones you think can solve the business model problems you have, and then you run experiments to get there. So if you're running interviews, you might come back and say, well, no one's buying our product. You, instead of getting into reasons why in the group setting, you tell people to go and study why that might be happening. So some of you might go and study the interview notes. Some of you might go and talk to more customers. But then you convene a few days later and come up with some ideas. You prioritize those ideas. And then as a team, you collectively run some experiments. And that experiments will help you uh, figure out the next set of things to do. So time boxing, very powerful. Because what I like about time is as long as the world doesn't come to an end, time always comes. Time never waits for anyone. So if you, on the calendar, set up three-week meetings for the rest of the year, you always have to meet every three weeks. You can make an excuse that I haven't finished the experiment or I need more time. You have to get together and talk about results, and that's the power of time boxing. So, so this is a, a, a practice that we have started to do quite a bit in our teams and something we teach others how to do. This is a bit more kind of futuristic, uh, uh, not futuristic, but future areas of interest, areas of interest, uh, of, of, of areas of focus that I'm spending time with. Um, so I talk about um, how Lean Startup in this talk, I talked about how by itself, not enough, you have to bring in some aspects of business modeling. I have been exposed to design thinking for many years, but I think it has a lot to offer that's very complementary with, with Lean Startup. So if I look at, if I characterize what each of these methodologies does in a single word, in a single word um, business modeling helps you think about your business model outcome. So it thinks about, you're basically focused on viability above everything else. Um, Lean Startup is more about validation. So you're really doing customer learning, you're doing validated learning, but you may have a customer that likes something, but if there are only five of them, that doesn't scale. So you have to ma uh, mirror that with business modeling. And I find design thinking brings a lot of practices around emotional, uh, desirable products. You have customer journey mapping, it allows you to get inside the customer's head. It allows you to really understand the problems well. And so this is an area that I'm particularly spending time in, not on any one of these three things, but at the intersection of all three. 
because I think that's an interesting convergence when you bring in the discipline of business modeling with uh, lean startup and design thinking, you can create some pretty interesting insights and you can use these sprint ideas to really test them very quickly and make the business model work. Okay, so one final uh, takeaway, uh, which is the item number 10. Um, this is something that I started my whole kind of work in here um, in, uh, with, with, with the lean and running lean. Um, this is what kind of inspired me is that I had built many products over the years um, and looking back, I realized that all my products started out with a solution idea. I had come up with some technology that I was interested in or some solution I wanted to bring to market. I call that the artist phase. That's when we think we just need to build something amazing and the market will accept it. Um, over the years, I've learned that your solution is not enough. All entrepreneurs have this bias for the solution. And if you start with a bad solution, you can brute force it to become a good one. It's kind of like the, like the input to the experiment. So starting with a solution is like building a key without a door. So you've gone and built out this key and you hope it opens a bunch of doors, but you are really using a trial and error process. And maybe you get lucky. Some of us get success that way, but it's not a very optimal way of doing it. So if I show you what, what these things might look like, all of these things here are really solutions. Some of you might be working in these spaces and you look at them as trends. And that is great because these, again, might be very interesting inventions but our job is to turn inventions into innovations. So an innovation is basically an invention that's out there that, make, that, that you use to make a business model work. Um, one company that comes to mind that does this very, very well is Apple. Try to think about all the, all the things Apple has invented. There aren't that many. Uh, the things that they do that they are best known for are the things they didn't even invent themselves. They were things other people built, like the user interface, which was done at Xerox. Uh, even the iPhone, the multi-touch technology was not something they invented. They actually got from somewhere else. But what they do very well is they take inventions that work and turn them into innovations that customers want. Um, so they understand what customers are trying to get done and they build the right things to get there. So that's kind of the mindset you need to have. Nothing wrong with being in the invention business, but that's a much harder thing to invent and innovate it's far easier to take inventions that are working, that have come out of the lab, and turn them into innovations. So the other way to say this is don't focus just on solutions. Switch that around, and when you start with problems or, or the doors that are worth opening, you actually can open doors to places that you actually want to go instead of hitting the wall with keys that don't go anywhere. All right, thank you very much.